NASA contracts SpaceX to deorbit the ISS, China returns the first ever samples from the far side of the moon, and Dream Chaser misses its ride into space. I'm Alicia Siegel for NSF. It's Friday the 28th of June, and there's much more to come this week in Spaceflight. This week, China became the first country to return samples from the far side of the moon. The Chang'e 6 re-entry capsule with the collected material touched down on the steps of the country's Inner Mongolia region on June 25th at 6.07 UTC. This historic mission was originally launched in early May, and after a few weeks of travel, on June 1st, the Chang'e 6 lander touched down in the Apollo Basin on the surface of the moon. Soon after touchdown, the lander used its scoop to collect samples from the surface and its drill to collect samples at a depth of about one meter. It also deployed a mini-rover that took this awesome picture of Chang'e 6 on the moon. Chang'e 6 wasn't just there to collect samples, though. It also carried instruments that were contributed by international partners, including France, Italy, and Sweden. Additionally, a CubeSat contributed by Pakistan was released from the vehicle a few days after launch while on its way to the moon. A few days later, on June 3rd, Chang'e 6 performed the first ever launch from the far side of the moon, sending the samples into low lunar orbit for rendezvous with Chang'e 6's orbital module. Then, on June 6th, the samples docked and transferred to the re-entry capsule. After that, the capsule, now with the samples on board, headed back to Earth where it touched down under a parachute on June 25th. The capsule has since been flown to Beijing where the sample canister has been extracted. Next up, the samples will be catalogued and made available to the scientific community. We can't wait to see what discoveries will be made with these lunar samples. A spacewalk at the International Space Station was canceled after only 30 minutes due to a leak in a spacesuit cooling system. On Monday, NASA astronauts Tracy Caldwell Dyson and Michael Barrett were scheduled to step outside of the space station to perform some maintenance. The extravehicular activity, or EVA, had already been postponed a week earlier after Matthew Dominic experienced spacesuit discomfort issues. Dominic was originally set to perform the spacewalk with Caldwell Dyson, but was replaced by Barrett for the next attempt. The EVA was planned to last for about six and a half hours, but was aborted shortly after the airlock's hatch was opened and a leak in the cooling system umbilical of Caldwell Dyson's spacesuit sprayed water all around the airlock. Talk about a wardrobe malfunction. With aging spacesuits causing problems during EVAs, NASA has been looking to replace them with newly developed suits. Unfortunately, Collins Aerospace, one of the contractors for that program, backed out of the agreement this week. In 2022, Collins was awarded a NASA contract to develop and build the next generation of spacesuits for use on the ISS and for moonwalks during the Artemis program. However, the company was unable to meet NASA's timeline, which includes a demonstration at the ISS in 2026. While the contract for a next-generation EVA suit has now been terminated, Collins will continue to support the current spacesuits at the ISS since the company already provides the life support systems on them. Now, even though Collins will no longer provide a next-generation EVA spacesuit, the program's other contractor, Axiom Space, is still working on their own spacesuit for NASA, but it's a lunar version. Now, you may have even caught our show last month where we sat down with an engineer working on these suits, but of course, each of them are very much purpose-built with entirely different goals. So unfortunately, at this time, NASA will no longer have the option for two dissimilar redundant options to serve as backups for one another in the event that one experiences issues, and it's unclear if and when NASA will be seeking a replacement. After many delays and much hope, what didn't happen this week was the return of Starliner Calypso, as the spacecraft's undocking has now been delayed until further notice. Starliner was originally set to return about a week after its launch on June 6th, but the stay at the ISS has been extended several times now. While the reason for the delay has not been announced, it's likely related to issues that it experienced on the flight up. On the approach to the space station, multiple thrusters misbehaved, and up to five were disabled. Since these thrusters are located on the capsule's service module, which is disposed of before entry, staying in space for longer will allow Boeing engineers to study the issue in more detail. In addition to the thruster issues, there are also multiple helium leaks. While some shut valves currently prevent Starliner from leaking, these valves will need to be opened for the return trip. The capsule does carry 10 times more helium than it needs for a safe return, but NASA and Boeing want to eliminate these issues before flying any regular missions. <laughs> 
NASA and Boeing are confident the capsule will still be able to make a safe return, as Calypso is still cleared for emergencies. In fact, earlier this week, NASA astronauts Barry Wilmore and Sunita Williams sheltered in Starliner when there was a possibility that the ISS might be struck by debris from an old Russian satellite that broke up at an altitude near the station. In these situations, astronauts often take shelter in their return vehicle as a precaution. No return date has yet been announced, but Calypso is certified to stay at the station for 45 days. Additionally, NASA and Boeing are holding a press conference later today to provide updates on Starliner's return. So perhaps by next week's episode, the picture will become a lot more clear. Firefly recently announced its five-year growth plan, dubbed Firefly Next, giving us a glimpse of what's in store for its future, and even teased, more coming soon. The first of these plans is a new set of launch pads. Firefly plans to convert Pad 0A at the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport, or MARS, on Wallops Island in Virginia to support the company's Alpha rocket. This pad used to host Northrop Grumman's Antares rocket, the previous version of which was retired last year. Firefly and Northrop Grumman are collaborating on the development of the next version of Antares and the future medium launch vehicle. Both vehicles will also be launched from Pad 0A at Mars. Firefly expects to have the pad ready to launch Alpha in 2025. But this isn't the only new launch pad for Firefly. Later in the week, the company announced a collaboration with the Swedish Space Corporation to launch Alpha from the spaceport at the s range Space Center in northern Sweden. The first launch of Alpha from Sweden is currently scheduled for 2026. With this, Firefly will become the first U.S. company to launch from continental Europe. While no orbital launches have been conducted from S-Range as of today, Firefly isn't the first to schedule an orbital launch from the spaceport. As covered in an earlier episode of This Week in Spaceflight, the South Korean company Perigee hopes to perform the first orbital launch from S-Range in 2025. The new launch pads were only just the first announcements under the Firefly Next plan. The company has teased other extensive plans over the next few years and hopes to become a market leader, rapidly launching to orbit, landing on the moon, and conducting on-orbit responsive satellite services. We can't wait to see what will come of all of these plans. Now let's take a quick glimpse at some other stories across space. Do you miss the days of the Starship hop tests? Well, China's got you covered! This week, the state-owned Shanghai Academy of Spaceflight Technology performed a 10-kilometer hop test. The vehicle that performed this test is a prototype for future methane-powered reusable launch vehicles. The prototype has a diameter of 3.8 meters and is powered by three engines. Leaked footage shows the vehicle softly touching down on the ground at the end of a successful flight. PLD Space is building a launch complex for its Miura 5 rocket at Europe's spaceport in Kourou in French Guiana. The Spanish company recently announced that it will be investing 10 million euros in order to build the infrastructure needed to successfully launch Miura 5. Miura 5 is a small sat launch vehicle powered by biokerosene and liquid oxygen. PLD Space plans to recover the first stage by splashing it down in the ocean under a parachute similar to how Rocket Lab recovers Electron. If all goes to plan, Miura 5 will launch for the first time from Kourou at the end of 2025. The new launch complex is being constructed at the former launch site of the Diamond rocket, which is being converted into a multi-user launch site. Rocket Factory Augsburg and ESAR Aerospace have also announced plans to use this site, but with their launch slated for 2025, PLD hopes to be the first non-institutional operator to reach orbit from Kourou. Dream Chaser has missed its ride to space. This week, United Launch Alliance announced that it will no longer be flying the space plane on the next flight of the company's Vulcan rocket. Instead, the next Vulcan flight will be carrying a mass simulator, or as ULA calls it, an inert payload. We have an inert payload, uh, a so-called mass simulator that we had built for uh, CERT-1 as a backup to the Peregrine uh, payload that we did actually fly. So we have retained that all this time. That's what we will fly on CERT-2. Now why couldn't ULA just wait for Dream Chaser to be ready? Well, Dream Chaser was supposed to be the payload for the rocket's second certification flight, which ULA needs to perform before Vulcan is allowed to fly national security space missions for the U.S. Space Force. Two of these missions are currently scheduled for later this year, and clearly ULA did not want the delays with Dream Chaser to affect these launches. ULA and Sierra Space, the company developing Dream Chaser, are now working to find a new opportunity to launch the space plane. But considering Vulcan's manifest, it might be a while before Dream Chaser gets off the ground. SpaceX is going to deorbit the ISS. 
Now, don't worry, it won't happen anytime soon, but NASA is making plans to dispose of the station at the end of its useful life in 2030, and the agency has awarded SpaceX an $843 million contract to develop the deorbit vehicle needed to do it. The ISS was originally planned to last until 2020, but its mission has been extended multiple times by the involved space agencies. The U.S., Japan, Canada, and ESA have committed to operate the space station until 2030, while Russia has currently committed to continue at least until 2028. When the partnership ends, the station will be deorbited and land in the South Pacific, far away from any land to minimize risk of causing damage. Earlier studies have suggested using a modified version of the Russian Progress cargo vehicle to deorbit the space station, but it was later concluded that this task is beyond the capabilities of Progress, prompting NASA to ask the industry for proposals in September of 2023. While SpaceX is now contracted to build the deorbit vehicle, it'll ultimately be operated by NASA. The launch of the vehicle, however, will be a separate contract, so it's not guaranteed that SpaceX will also launch it. Now let's go over all of the traffic in space during the past week, and then we'll see what's coming up next week in spaceflight. Starting off the week on June 22nd, we had a Changzheng 2C launch from the Xichang Satellite Launch Center in China. The rocket carried the Space Variable Objects Monitor satellite into low Earth orbit. This joint French and Chinese mission carries a suite of telescopes to study gamma ray bursts, which are the result of explosions of massive stars. The satellite is designed to work in conjunction with telescopes back on Earth. The spacecraft uses its onboard telescopes to detect gamma ray bursts, which are blocked by the atmosphere and therefore invisible from Earth. It sends the precise location of the burst to ground-based telescopes around the world, which then measure the burst in more detail in other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. Alongside this satellite, the rocket carried a second passenger called Catch-1. This is the first of a constellation of small space-based X-ray telescopes developed by the Chinese Academy of Sciences. But unfortunately, the star of this mission on social media anyway was actually the first stage booster of the rocket, which once again landed dangerously close to a village in China. Yeah, that's definitely not the best way to return one of those. The next day, a Falcon 9 took to the skies to launch the second batch of Group 10 Starlink satellites. You may remember from previous episodes that this mission has seen a few delays. It was first scheduled to fly two weeks ago, but scrubbed due to bad weather. Then, a retry the next day saw a rare abort after engine startup. This led SpaceX to roll the vehicle back to the hangar for inspections and to make way for the Astra-1P satellite, which took priority in the schedule. We covered that launch last week. But the third time was the charm, and the mission finally lifted off on June 23rd at 1715 UTC from Space Launch Complex 40 in Florida. This mission carried 22 Starlink V2 mini-satellites into low-Earth orbit. The booster for this mission, B-1078, flew for the 11th time and ended its mission by successfully touching down on SpaceX's drone ship a short fall of Gravitas. Another Starlink mission took place on June 24th at 3.47 UTC. This time, 13 direct-to-cell satellites and 7 Starlink V-2 mini-satellites were launched into low Earth orbit from Vandenberg. Booster B-1075 also flew on its 11th mission and it successfully landed downrange on drone ship Of Course I Still Love You. This week, we also had the first Falcon Heavy launch of the year. On June 25th, the vehicle lifted off from Historic Launch Complex 39A in Florida, bringing the GOES-U weather satellite for the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration into a geostationary transfer orbit. GOES-U brings some improvements compared to previous geostationary operational environmental satellites, or GOES for short. Not only does GOES-U observe at a higher resolution, it can also do it a lot more often. Previously, the time needed between images was 30 minutes, but with GOES-U, the time is reduced to only 30 seconds. With these improvements, meteorologists can forecast the weather much more accurately and precisely. In addition to observing weather on Earth, GOES-U also carries instruments to observe solar weather. This is important because solar flares can cause problems for the power grid, airline flights, and the astronauts on the ISS. This was the 10th overall flight of Falcon Heavy, and it flew with a complete set of brand new boosters. The center core on the mission was expended, but the side cores, B-1072 and B-1086, landed at landing zones 1 and 2. It was another spectacular side-by-side landing. Wow, that view never gets old. And wrapping up the week, on June 27th, another Falcon 9 launched a Starlink mission from Florida. This time, 23 Starlink V-2 mini-satellites were launched into low-Earth orbit for Starlink Group 10. 
The booster flying this mission, B-1062, lifted off for a record-breaking 22nd time. It successfully landed on drone ship Just Read the Instructions and is now on its way back to be prepared for its next flight. With the three Starlink launches this week, SpaceX has launched a total of 6,698 satellites, of which 477 have re-entered and 5,232 have moved into their operational orbit. Going into next week, a Falcon 9 is set to launch from Vandenberg on June 29th. This will be the second launch of Starshield satellites for the National Reconnaissance Office. Starshield is a network of spy satellites developed by SpaceX and north of Grumman. The two-hour window for this launch opens at 3.14 UTC. Later that day, a Changzheng 7A is scheduled to launch from the Wenchang Space Launch Site in China. Liftoff is scheduled for 12 o'clock UTC. Details about the payload for this mission have not yet been announced. On June 30th, we'll have the third launch of the H-3 rocket from the Tanegashima Space Center in Japan. This will also be its first operational launch as well. The mission will carry the Advanced Land Observing Satellite 4 into sun-synchronous orbit. This satellite uses synthetic aperture radar to observe disaster-struck areas and monitor deforestation. Later in the week, we'll have the launch of Firefly's Noise of Summer mission on the company's Alpha rocket. The mission will launch eight CubeSats for NASA's CubeSat launch initiative as part of Firefly's Venture Class Launch Services Demo 2 contract with NASA. The launch will take place from Vandenberg on July 1st, with the 30-minute window opening at 4.03 UTC. NSF is providing live stream production services for Firefly's official live stream, so tune in on our YouTube channel to watch the launch. After that, on July 3rd, a Falcon 9 is scheduled to launch another Starlink mission from Florida. This launch will carry more direct-to-south satellites into low Earth orbit. The four-hour launch window for this launch is set to open at 6.01 UTC. And closing out the week, a Changzheng 6A is set to launch another unknown payload on July 4th. Liftoff is planned for 2300 UTC from the Taiyan Satellite Launch Center in China. And that's your weekly update of spaceflight news. We'll see you all again next week to recap this week in spaceflight.